Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Me llamo Íñigo Chaso, llevo la línea de negocio de industrialización del software en AT Sistemas y esta tarde vengo a presentaros a Jesús Strauss, que es el Channel Partner Coordinator para EMEA de eh, Synopsys. Y nos va a hablar de la seguridad en aplicaciones a la velocidad de DevOps con eh, Interactive Application Security Testing y su solución. Jesús, buenas tardes, bienvenido. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Muchísimas gracias, Iñigo, por tu presentación. Pues bien, eh, bueno, en primer lugar quería agradecer a, a todo el equipo gerencial, técnico y de marketing de AT Sistemas por darnos la oportunidad de participar en esta DevOps Conference, en la tercera edición, que está muy interesante, de verdad, chicos. Es que tengo que felicitarlos. Y pues nada. Eh, pues estoy representando a Synopsys Software Integrity Group, la división de negocios de Application Security and Quality. El día de hoy, eh, pues eh, me complace muchísimo tener una corta charla, eh, la cual va a estar basada en AppSec eh, a la velocidad de DevOps con IAST. Eh, esta charla este, va a estar conducida por mi compañero, eh, nuestro ingeniero de ventas experto, en la herramienta Seeker, que es nuestra solución para IAST, el señor Scott Tolley. Y pues, eh, sin más, um, le, le doy pues la entrada a nuestro amigo Scott. Y una vez pues, que terminemos la charla, pues más que bienvenido a hacer preguntas para seguir interactuando. Buenas tardes. Hi there, my name is Scott Tolley. I'm an application security engineer at Synopsys. I'm very pleased to be here at DevOps Spain 2021, uh, joining you virtually, of course. And I'm going to be talking to you about application security at the speed of DevOps. So this is with a, a new approach to application security tooling called IAST for interactive application security testing. So why might we need a, a new approach anyway? Well, DevOps represents a step change in release cadence, and that's a great thing from the point of view of time to market and also the quality of your software with better, faster feedback cycles. But it's also a breaking change when it comes to traditional application security processes and tools. Now, IAST is one of the newest approaches to AppSec tooling. It's been born very much in the era of DevOps, designed for DevOps and that cadence. So it's cheaper and faster to run than traditional tools in this kind of pipeline. Now, you don't just have to take my word for this. Uh, we have, for example, a case study from Forrester here from a financial services firm, and they adopted IAST and got great gains in terms of efficiency, reducing their pen test engagements from four days down to 1.5 days in each cycle. Uh, already a, a, a good result, of course, in terms of time and money. But then also a big change in terms of what they actually found when they made use of that pen testing. They went from finding hundreds of high impact defects to not finding any because they were able to find and fix them earlier in the SDLC. Now, that's, that's the difference between viewing the output of your pipeline as a, an SDLC generating a correct high quality software and then trying to test security back into it at the end, as opposed to having an, a secure SDLC which of which the output is secure application software. So if you just try to take existing tools, existing techniques and force them into a developed pipeline, you're going to get pushback. It's pretty much guaranteed. And the first problem is that these, these kinds of tools traditionally just generate lots and lots of noise. They're often quite imprecise and that's the reason they've got to generate hundreds and thousands of, of uh, uh, findings uh, in order to actually find the three or four things that you really care about. Now, 10 years ago, this wasn't a problem. If I have a three month or a six month release cycle, I can probably take a week at some point to run some really slow tools and then look through hundreds and thousands of results and triage out the false positives and, and deal uh, with the highest impact findings before I actually release. But that doesn't fly in today's cadences. And furthermore, those cadences, that pipeline, that's where people are working, that's where people want to work, and it's the way they want to work. So if I go to somebody who has a fully functioning, humming DevOps pipeline, you know, pushing value through the value stream in 30 minutes, and I say, good news, it's DevSecOps now, so you're going to need to run this hour-long uh, black box DAST scanner in your pipeline, uh, I'm going to get told to, uh, to leave, uh, ask me how I know. We have to find a way to maximize application security at the same time as respecting development velocity, because it's one of the big reasons why we're doing DevOps in the first place. We have to minimize the, the, the time and effort we're actually asking people to make use of 
uh, in order to, to consume the output from any of these tools if we're going to integrate them into a DevOps pipeline. That's really important. Just to dive down a little bit deeper into some of the issues with the traditional tools for, for DevOps, for the, on the, the right-hand side of things, so when an application is running, either in pre-prod or in production, you can run scanners and you can do pen testing activities, of course. And the issue, or one of the issues with these approaches, is that the results are, are from the point of view of the exterior of the system. And it's great to know that you've got a problem, a vulnerable page or URL or parameter or something like that. But that's not where the developer is living. The developer is living in their code, and that's where they need to see where the problem is so that they can understand it and then fix it. And then when it comes to CI CD integration, well, as I've already alluded to, it's not that it can't be done with dynamic scanners. It, it is possible, but there is a, a, a there's a problem of time here. It also requires a lot of work to set up to actually work properly in the first place. Uh, for example, you have to teach a dash scanner how it can log into your application. Um, it's often a lot more complicated than that in practice because, okay, you can log in, but can this data scanner actually successfully navigate around the different workflows and features in your application? Uh, that's a lot of work set up. And furthermore, you have to maintain that because that tends to change over time. This is typically not work that people budget for. Now, of course, pen testers are great. And if you've got a talented pen tester or you can afford their services, then, then that's brilliant. Uh, it's just that I haven't yet found a way to chop one up and integrate them into a DevOps pipeline. Uh, pen testers, I am still working on that, so, so watch out. Now, when it comes to the uh, static uh, side of things, so static source code analysis or software composition analysis, they always are going to have the same issue, which is that they just don't know what happens when the software really runs. There's no runtime verification, and that always leads to two issues. There are false positives, of course, and worse than false positives, from my perspective, is noise. So when the tools are saying something which is true, but actually you don't care about. So what if a static source code analysis tool tells you that you're not respecting good security practices um, in some method which is never deployed, uh, it's simply not accessible when the application is running. Well, I'm willing to bet that you don't have time to go and fix those kinds of issues, quite frankly, and who does? And, and software has a massive surface area. So enough about the problems, let's talk about some, some solutions, what we can do differently. And this is the proposition. What if there was a way to turn all the testing, the functional testing you're already doing into security testing? So I mean the, the QA testing, making sure that your application is behaving correctly. Uh, this could be fully automated tests, so maybe you do some a bit of manual testing or exploratory testing as well. Both are fair game. But just have the testers do what they normally do and without any extra effort or extra steps, just turn that magically into very precise, low force positive security testing. Sounds good, right? So how could this be done? Well. The IS approach is agent-based. So you have an application you're testing, and this could be a single application, monolithic, it could be a distributed application, it could be microservices, doesn't matter. But you deploy an agent uh, wherever your application is running in these different services. And that's going to monitor your application during the testing process while you're running your normal QA tests. So of course, your application will be receiving requests and code will be running as a result. And then of course, data is going to flow around your application. You might receive some data in a front-end application, pass it to a back-end service. Now, if we see something happening in this flow that represents a security vulnerability, uh, we can report that straight away, or rather the, the agent can report that straight away. Or maybe you've got some sensitive data, some PII of your customers. Well, if we see that that is being written to a, a plain text log, perhaps somewhere in the back end, well, we can detect that because it's, it's white box testing. It's observing the code and the data as it runs and then reporting on any issues straight away. So there are a lot of advantages to this approach. First of all, it's extremely quick to set up in any kind of automated pipeline. If you're already doing automated tests, you just have to add the agent. And at that point, all your automated tests become security tests with no extra effort. You get far fewer false positives and noise for the simple reason that we've got pretty perfect visibility. We see what's happening in the code. We just saw it happen. We see what's happening with the data. We just saw it flow like that to that place. There are far fewer false positives with that approach. The feedback's really quick. No extra scanning steps to actually uh, carry out, just the testing you're doing already. 
And it's really easy, therefore, to, to drill down and quickly identify the two or three things you really want to fix before you release. So lots of advantages to be had. And, and this is the, the fundamental uh, value. It's making less demands on your engineering time because it generates less noise, uh, fewer reports, but much higher quality reports you're going to want to do something with compared to all the, the existing um, approaches. The end-to-end -end flow looks a little bit like this, typically. You've got developers writing code like normal, checking in, and then, of course, there's going to be uh, some kind of tests happening somewhere, maybe fully automated, maybe a few manual processes, doesn't really matter. But while that functional testing is happening, there's going to be I asked watching the, the code and the data in the background. Uh, the testers might not even know you're using I asked. And then if we do see any new problems, we can push that into Jira for bug tracking or Azure DevOps or email notifications, Slack, that kind of thing. That's a workflow decision for you. And you might want to take some go, no go decisions for your pipeline. If, for example, you find critical new vulnerabilities being introduced into your application. Right, that's it, I think, for the theory. I'm now going to swap out to a live demonstration. So this is probably where things go wrong, of course. Uh, so here I have on the right uh, an application that I'm testing. I'm using the WebGoat project from OWASP, which is intentionally vulnerable. So I know there's going to be some problems in there. Uh, and then on the left, I have the UI for Seeker, which is currently looking at any detected vulnerabilities for me. So if I go and, and I'm going to pretend just to carry out some kind of manual uh, test case now, and you can see that already as soon as I start to use the application, that means there's activity and Seeker is detecting that there are, there are problems in this system. I just carry out my test case, whatever it might be. Maybe I've got to navigate to a certain page uh, and then uh, click on something. And maybe I'm supposed to enter in my surname to, to look it up in some kind of online database, get my account info, you know, that's it, that's enough for now. So let's head back here to the Seeker uh, UI and take a look at what it is it's seen it doesn't like. Well, again, an intentionally vulnerable application, so lots of things to look at, but let's take a look at this SQL injection, for example, which was on the field I was just using. So what it's gonna give me, and as you can see really quickly, is both the, the view from the exterior of the system. So what's the problem? It's SQL injection attack uh, vector. What's the, the vulnerable uh, URL or page? Uh, what's the parameter that's vulnerable? But we've also got this view into the code. So I can take a look at the stack trace. I can see where the problem is in the code. Uh, it does a good job of identifying what code is actually uh, my own code, proprietary code, as opposed to all the Java libraries and um, you know, uh, frameworks like Spring and so forth. But you can configure that. And it also sees the data that's flowing around the application. So I'm going to see, for example, the SQL Spring that was actually built up internally and where my user data got added into that. I can drill down and see the data flow a bit more clearly, see how my surname that I entered into the form was sent in a post request. And of course, I can go and take a look at the, the, the technical details of that request if I like. And I can see how that, that value gets passed around. It gets built into a string. The uh, system is adding an apostrophe there and then building my user data into an SQL query and finally using that without ever having sanitized it. So that means that this is vulnerable to a classic SQL injection attack. Now, in addition to that, the fact that the, the IS engine has just seen what looks like a pretty clear vulnerability, uh, it can also often actually validate this finding. So here under verification proof, we can see that the, uh, what, what it did to, to validate this finding is it can actually uh, uh, interfere slightly with the, the values uh, to see whether or not it can actually carry out an attack uh, based on the vulnerability. And in this case, it, it sees that if it adds an extra apostrophe into the user data, then it's going to trigger an SQL injection inside the application. And that's the proof, even though that was never visible from the outside of the application, that this, it, it is indeed possible uh, to have user control over that string and to basically carry out an SQL injection attack. So now this makes my prioritization really easy. I've got a, a seeker verified uh, uh, issue that's critical. Uh, this is definitely what I want going to want to focus on uh, in, in with, with the time that's available to me in my, in my engineering life cycle. I can take a look at the, the request, of course, and so forth, or maybe some advice about what it is I should be doing differently to, to deal with this kind of problem, or maybe even links to uh, online training uh, if you have such a subscription to the Synopsys uh, e-learning uh, system. 
Now, uh, that's a pretty simple case. And uh, of course it was a manual case, but if we are doing DevOps, we're probably very heavily oriented towards uh, automated testing wherever possible. So let's check out a different example application. In this case, Hippotech. This is a, uh, a demo application for online mortgage applications. And in this case, I've got a nice suite of uh, Selenium tests uh, that I can run here. Uh, and um, this will, uh, this is something I can just, uh, should be able to just run straight away actually. Let's just try running one of those tests. And that's going to run through all the test steps. This is something I want to automate, run all my test cases and put them into some kind of uh, automated pipeline, end-to-end -end pipeline. Now, I am going to just go and shut down that application there. So let's do a stop all and go and take a look at my pipeline where I have these automated tests. So in this case, it's an example with Git for version control. I'm using Jenkins for the pipeline. You can see I've, you know, I'm doing the Git checkout, building, unit testing, doing automated testing with Selenium in this case, and then a compliance check to see whether or not I've actually detected any new uh, critical or high impact vulnerabilities with the, the, the IASP, which is monitoring the testing. And then finally deployment if I'm happy with what I've got. So let's do something a little bit perverse. Let's go to my editor here, IntelliJ. I'm going to uncomment out some dangerous code. Uh, I am afraid I have a command injection vulnerability kind of built in here, uh, just to make sure that something, something bad happens. Uh, I apologize. So let's get that checked in. Let's add that. Working hard at DevOps Spain. And then push that into my Git repository. Now, let's head back out to Jenkins here. It should detect the um, fact that there's some, some new code uh, and it's going to kick off the pipeline. So just getting started there. Uh, maybe I can go and uh, view this in the uh, blue ocean. Yep, pipeline's running. Okay, so it's cloned the code, built the code, run the unit tests. Now it's running my Selenium automated test suite, and Seeker is watching in the background to to examine the running code, to see what's happening to the data as it flows around the application, and then there'll be a quick check at the end just to see whether or not any new problems were detected. At which point I should get some some feedback if there are. Now, normally I wouldn't run uh, these tests uh, headed with a, uh, a window that pops up, but in this case, just for demonstration purposes, well, those tests should soon be should soon be running. Famous last words, of course. Here we go. Okay. So I've got about five test cases here. Check to see whether I can apply for a mortgage, log in, log out sign up to the blog, that kind of thing. And then that's done, or more or less. Now check to see whether or not it detected anything new. I say new because, of course, there might be existing uh, issues which I might have decided not to actually fix for some reason, in which case I might have classified them. But in this case, no, indeed, it has indeed. Uh, so the tests were all fine. The tests uh, passed nicely. Uh, but I can see that I have uh, compliance issues. Um, uh, oh, got to restart Firefox. That's brilliant. <laughs> There's always something. Thank you, Firefox. Try that again. Okay, so there's a compliance issue based on the compliance rules I had set. And so we've got an open vulnerability now. This is the command injection that I just introduced uh, intentionally. So if we go back to the server now, we can see that in the Hippotech project, One that's not compliant. I look at the vulnerabilities and I select the right project. So I'm in there. This is the command injection I just introduced. 
And uh, we can see that it's, a, it's been verified, so we're sure this is an issue. It's obviously critical, it's demand injection. And two interesting things, first of all, it's cross-project. Now, what that means is that there are actually multiple services that were engaged here. There was a front-end Strava application that received the request that then passed untrusted data into a back-end uh, Java application, uh, so cross-services. And then tracked as well, um, because with this policy, I have said that I want to have a, a work item created, in this case, in Jira, if I have any new critical or high impact uh, vulnerabilities. So I can go out and take a look at that as well and uh, see uh, that I, you know, I now have a work item in my sprint to, to deal with as a result of my policies and what has been detected uh, with IAST. So uh, let's pop back to the presentation now, just to uh, finish up here. And it looks like I'm going to have to minimize that. There we go. Okay, so it, it's really easy to get started uh, with IAST in any DevOps pipeline. You just have to add the agent to any of the testing jobs to make sure this information is being fed back. That means as soon as you start running any of your tests uh, in your sprint, you're going to start getting these kinds of results so you can start seeing what your security posture is. And then during your first retrospective, uh, you've got the chance to review that. You can deal with any high impact uh, defects you need to deal with if you choose to do that. And then use baseline. And of course, you can repeat as you, you run more and more sprints and get more and more secure. That's the goal here. So in conclusion, there really isn't any need to wait for slow tooling in the inner loop of a DevOps pipeline with traditional tools to get security feedback. There, there is a faster way. And you, you, know, you don't need to be spending time looking at problems that are false positives or just impossible to understand for developers. This is a much faster approach than the traditional security tools. And the feedback is pretty real time from the point of view of the human eye. So this allows you to reduce pen testing costs by finding and fixing real problems quicker. And fundamentally, it's not the only way you can do application security, uh, but it's the fastest way that I know to get security into a DevOps pipeline and take that big step towards DevSecOps, which where is, is, is where I think we're all going, basically. So uh, thank you very much for your time and attention today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have or, or listening to any comments you may have as well. Don't hesitate to, to reach out. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of the, uh, the conference. Thank you very much. Ah, pues aquí estoy con Scott eh, para pues, eh, contestar las preguntas que ya tenemos algunas por aquí. Ahí le voy a hacer las, las preguntas en inglés a, a Scott y pues él, él va a contestarlas eh, en inglés, obviamente, eh, para pues, seguir interactuando. Ok, uh, first question, Scott, uh, we have here, um, it, does it make sense? And to execute a, a DAS test at the same time that I asked uh, with Seeker? Ah, yeah. Uh, so it, it does make sense, yes, uh, because the I asked Seeker won't interfere with any of the DAS testing. That will work like before. And then the I asked will be looking at what happens behind the scenes, and that can find more problems by actually looking at the running code and how that data flows inside the application at the same time. So, in short, Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Um, does uh, this work with uh, .NET applications? Uh, yes, and actually this is one of the things that you have to be aware of uh, when you're looking to see whether IAST can work for you uh, because it needs to actually see and understand the running code or in the case of .NET, the IL. It has to support that technology. So it supports .NET Framework uh, and .NET Core, so the new .NET. Uh, anything that runs on that platform, so it could be another language that's compiled to IL. The same is true in the Java space. So, of course, Java is the, the, the big classic, but it could be something like Groovy or Scala that is compiled down to the JVM. And then we support other languages like Node.js and Python and uh, Go as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question that we have here is, uh, does uh, IAST work with microservices architectures? Uh, 
Yes, it does. So, and actually not necessarily just microservices, but maybe distributed applications in general. So uh, yes, it will work with a monolithic application where you've got a single process running on a single machine, but it could equally be working with multiple processes that talk to each other over web services, uh, for example, uh, including microservices architecture. So this also works when you've got thousands of containers or similar that are all working together in a single system. Okay, thank you very much. So, and we have um, another question here. Um, what if we don't have any automated test? Ah, okay, yeah, so the, the, the real input that you need for IaaS to work for you is some way to actually exercise the application that you're, you're trying to test. So the, the classic case is where you've got some kind of uh, functional testing or QA testing, and in this case, it really doesn't matter if those tests are automated or if they're not automated, so if it's uh, human beings who are running through uh, old-fashioned test scripts, that's absolutely fine too. A seeker can observe that and work with that passively. Uh, so it doesn't really matter if you don't have automated tests. The other way is like if I'm thinking back to that first question about whether or not it makes sense to uh, use a seeker with a DAST tool running at the same time, you know, the DAS tool, that's another way of actually stimulating the application and make sure that it actually runs its code and we get some data in there. Uh, so that's another possibility. You could have a, a crawler or a spider that comes with a DAS tool like uh, OWASP Zap, for example, or any of the commercial alternatives. And, and equally, you could use IAST and Seeker to observe what's happening uh, while that spidering is running. Uh, these are all uh, possible approaches. And to sum that up, it might well be that you do two of those. So maybe you've got um, a fully automated, uh, fully automated quality assurance tests, and that's great. You observe that with Seeker when they're running, but then maybe you're also doing some manual exploratory testing afterwards where there's no clearly defined test case, but you can observe that with Seeker as well. So you can combine these different ways of stimulating the application and testing it at the same time automatically in the background with, with IAST. Ok, thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias a todos por, por sus preguntas y bueno, eh, estaremos en el área Expo eh, disponibles para pues, seguir contestando eh, todas las preguntas, dudas, explicaciones que, que tengan, no solo sobre eh, esta herramienta IAST, sino el resto de, del portafolio de Synopsis Software Integrity Group. Una vez más, gracias y pues cuídense mucho.